deal with the fractured treatment uh, of the hind limb. Um, so, so for the for fracture treatment, it's very important that you uh, realize that uh, um, these animals have had high impact uh, injury, and that uh, we may also have problems in other organs. So we always have to check these patients as trauma patients. Um, they can have uh, multiple trauma, they can have uh, problems in the thorax, they can have problems in the abdomen, um, hemoabdomen, pneumothorax is very common in patients with fracture. So never focus only on the fracture, but check the animal first for other trauma which may be uh, life-threatening. Also important, if you if a case is referred for a certain fracture, um, please check the whole animal again because there may be other fractures. It's very common that we have other fractures once we have uh, uh, seen one fracture. When an animal is transferred, transferred to the hospital, make sure that uh, the, uh, the patient is uh, immobilized and that already pain medication has been started. And also important for fracture treatment is that you have to check the dog uh, neurologically because many times uh, a dog with a fracture may not put any um, weight on the limb, but then you have to be sure that there is no neurological damage. So even with a fracture case, it's important to to do a neurological examination. Especially when the dog is very painful. Uh, fracture cases that are very painful are always suspicious also for spinal fractures. So you have to check uh, the whole animal. So let's go from top to bottom through the forelimb. And uh, then we'll start with scapula fractures. Uh, they are quite rare, they are commonly missed because the scapula is very hidden uh, uh, under the muscles, so it's not so apparent that the dog may have a scapula fracture. Um, we can pick up scapula fractures when we do a very good examination and then we may see some asymmetry between left and right shoulder part and that may indicate a uh, fracture of the scapula. So you have to feel for the spina of the scapula, check the acromion if they are symmetrical. Um, so fractures of the scapula can affect the body of the scapula, the spina, or the glenoid. And the glenoid, uh, when the glenoid is affected, we commonly have an intraarticular fracture. So when we approach the scapula, um, it's not that dif difficult. We can uh, easily approach the scapula um, from the lateral side, um, and we can uh, assess the spina and the body of the scapula. So we can see the uh, suprascapular muscle and the infrascapular muscle. And um, when we are uh, dealing with a fracture of the body of the scapula, then we may uh, treat this with a plate. And the plate is usually put on the cranial side of the spina, as you can see here in this slide. And we use then this triangular um, bone stock at the base of the scapula, at the base of the spina. And my mouse is not showing up, so I cannot point you there. Uh, so at the base, uh, at the base of the spina of the scapula, you can see that we have a very nice triangular piece of uh, bone stock where we can put the screws uh, for our plate. 
So plating is usually done on the cranial side of the spina. So when we have a glenoid fracture, so which is uh, the part near the shoulder joint, um, which is called the glenoid, then, so this is called the glenoid, that part near the shoulder joint, um, those can be intra-articular, and then they should be fixed with a leg screw. So if we do surgery in the glenoid, then we must realize that we have a nerve crossing under the acromion. So this nerve here, that is the suprascapular nerve. So when we are dealing with the glenoids, we always have to take care of uh, that nerve. It's a very small nerve, um, but it can be uh, damaged in the surgery, and then you will get um, muscle atrophy. So this is the suprascapular nerve. So fractures of the glenoid can be uh, can be dealt with plating. Um, and if we have an intra-articular fracture, it can be treated with a leg screw. When we have an intra-articular fracture, we really need to take care that we have good anatomic uh, reduction to prevent any future arthrosis. So the scapula also has some bony prominences where a muscle attaches, like the acromion or the tuberculum suprascapular. And when these fracture, then we have an avulsion fracture. An avulsion fracture, which is always instable because of the pulling force of a muscle. Um, and these should be treated by surgery. So for the tuberculum suprasmenoidale, which may also be an intra-articular fracture, we can deal with that with a leg screw, like you see on the left. And for the acromion, when we have an acromion fracture, we can treat that with a tension bent wire, like you see on the right. So we have to neutralize the uh, avulsion forces by surgical techniques, um, for instance a leg screw or a tension bent wire. Okay, so that is the scapula. Scapula is not so common, scapula fractures. Far more common, we see fractures of the humerus. And if they have fractures of the humerus, we um, try to differentiate, differentiate them in the proximal part, the shaft, which is the mid part, and the distal part of the humerus. But we can also have combinations, of course. It's very common that we have combination fractures all along the humerus. So let's look at the, at the humerus. So how can we approach the humerus? Well, the humerus is uh, quite a funny bone. We can approach it from many sides, um, depending on the level where the fracture is. If we are in the, in the proximal part, in the proximal part of the humerus, we can assess, we can approach the humerus from the cranial side, we can approach it from the lateral side. If we are in the shaft region, we can approach it from the cranial, the lateral, the medial side, and uh, the same is true for the distal part of the humerus. We can also approach that from the medial, the lateral, and the cranial side for fracture treatment. So we can apply uh, implants on many sides of the humerus, depending on the side of the fracture. And it is also important to realize that um, on the humerus we have different force fields. So in the proximal part, in the proximal part, we uh, the tension 
side of the bone is on the cranial side. So we rather put a plate on the cranial side in the proximal humerus, whereas in the distal humerus, uh, the tension side is more on the lateral side. So then we may apply the plate on the lateral side. Also important is that if we are dealing, if we are approaching on the lateral side of the humerus, especially in the distal part, then we have, then we need to realize that we have the radial nerve lying there, so we have to be careful not to damage the radial nerve. So for the humerus, plates can be applied on the lateral side, on the medial side, and on the cranial side. We have many options to choose for the humerus. So here we see uh, examples of uh, fractures in the proximal humerus, where we have uh, we may have a growth plate fracture in the proximal part of the humerus, and this can be dealt with pins or brush pins. So on the second image from the left, we can see the uh, rush pinning technique. Now wait for the pointer, then I can point you out. Thank you. Thank you very much. So here we see the technique of rush pinning, where we uh, enter two pins, and these pins touch the cortex on the other side, and then they slide off. This technique is uh, commonly used for growth plate fractures. Um, for instance, here in the proximal part, but it can also be used in the distal part. I will tell a little bit more on this technique later in the second talk. So for the, uh, for the humerus, the tension side of the bone in the proximal part is on the cranial side. That's why if we have a fracture here, we put the plate on the cranial side. So if we have a fracture of the shaft of the humerus, like as depicted in these images, we may put the plate on the lateral side or on the cranial side. Uh, those are the most common sites to put plates in humeral shaft fractures. The cranial side is quite straight, so it's a very straight, slightly bent surface. Whereas on the lateral side, there is a twist in the bone. So the lateral side is not the most easy part of the humerus to plate, but it's the tension side in the distal part. And especially in the distal part, there will be a twist in the bone that uh, you have to take care of with your plate. So here we have an example of a dog with a, this was a Rhodesian Ridgeback of two years that was hit by a car and uh, was presented with this uh, complex uh, fracture. It is a multi-fragment fracture. So we see a, a big proximal part, we see a middle smaller part and then we see the distal part of the fracture fragment. And we have some uh, contraction of the fracture, and we have dislocation. We have fissures in the bone fragments. And we, from these two radiographs, graphs, we cannot be sure whether this fracture has not extended into the joint. So this was uh, uh, reconstructed with, uh, with multiple uh, implants. So if we look at the uh, the initial radiograph, then we try to, in this complex fracture, we first try to restore this part, bring this together, because then we have reduced this fracture to a two fragment fracture, and then we can plate it on the cranial side. So in this case, we chose to 
first restore the distal part with a medial plate in the distal humerus, um, we can very nicely apply the plate to the medial side and then connect that with the proximal part with a plate on the cranial side. So that's what we did. We started on the medial side with a plate. You can see the plate here. This was a 2.7 plate on the medial side. And then we also included a pin, intramedullary pin, for alignment and then connected the distal part with the proximal part with the plate on the cranial side. <clears throat> so you can see here different applications of uh, plates on different approaches. There's also circlage wire. You can see the circlage wire. This was needed to contain all the fissures that were present in this bone. And now we can also see that the elbow joint was not affected in this joint, in this fracture. So this was uh, quite uh, uh, fortunate for this dog that we have no fractures going into the elbow joint. And then we uh, followed this um, along to see how this uh, yield. So here we have the post-operative image in January of the last year, then we have two months later, this is at two months, we can see that callus formation is starting to build up here on the caudal side, if you compare it with this image. And then this callus formation smooths out, it remodels, and here we can see remodeling complete. So this is um, eight months later, we can see that the fracture has uh, nicely healed on this image. This is the dog at uh, one week after the surgery. So this dog uh, went home. You can see that uh, we have put a bandage on it. And of course, the dog should be kept on the leash. But it's using the limp already. This is at one week after the surgery. And that is very important. Early, early mobilization of these patients will prevent a lot of complications. So early mobilization means that they are going to use the muscles. We have a very traumatic uh, region there. Uh, so we need early mobilization, physiotherapy, to keep the muscles uh, active. It's very important with this type of fracture that the dog starts to extend and flex the elbow at an early phase, otherwise we have uh, fibrotic uh, contractures. So if we look at the other view, um, this is the AP view in this case, we can see that uh, at after two months here, we can see that two of the screws broke. Not sure if you can see that. You can see here two, two fractures of the screws and they are still present there. But the other implants stayed nicely intact. So we didn't touch that, we didn't change that. The fracture was healing, the dog was uh, uh, using the limb more and more. So we just left this place and did not touch that broken screw. But it also told us that the dog is doing a lot with the limb. If screws break, it means that there is uh, multiple stresses on the implants, so the, the dog was using the limb quite uh, actively. Okay, so how about other techniques for the humerus? like external fixation. Um, also external fixation can be applied to the humerus and then we commonly choose the proximal side of the humerus or the lateral side. 
and we can apply a type 1 external fixture to the humerus and we can even connect it with an IM pin in a tie-in fashion. So when then the external fixation is connected to the intramedullary pin. So here we have a, an example of a six, mar, six months old um, Belgian shepherd dog was hit by a car, no weight bearing on the forelimb. It had pain and crepitation on the humerus, general exam was stable, and we took radiographs. So here we see a, again a rather complex uh, fracture. It's a mid shaft fracture. We have open growth plates. It's a young dog. We have open growth plates. We have dislocation, contraction, dislocation to the cranial side. If we talk about dislocation, we always uh, define the dislocation on the distal part of the fracture. So this is dislocation to the cranial side. We have dislocation here to the medial side, because this, you see that cromium there, this is the lateral side. So we have dislocation to the medial side here, and we have some small fragments. So this is how we classify the fracture. This is a closed fracture. It's a extra articular fracture, no joints involved. Um, and it's instable. This is not a stable fracture because we have multiple fragments. Um, so the options for treatment in this case were plating, external fixator, um, combined maybe with an intramedular layer pin, um, interlocking nail, and then if there were severe financial restrictions, restrictions on the part of the owner, then we could also use a shoulder bandage splint as a last option. As a coincidental finding, in this case, we also saw OCD of the shoulder joint, in this case. Um, we chose to treat this with an external fixator because it was a young dog, um, and the advantage of an external fixture is that we can approach it in a closed manner, so we don't have to open the fracture, and we rely on the very fast healing in young dogs. So we classify the fracture. It's a mid diaphyseal multiple humerus fracture. Treatment options, bone plate, external fixture, I am pin alone may not be sufficient for this case. It is, it is possible, but it is not a, uh, uh, it's not the best option because uh, the pin gives longitudinal, longitudinal stability, but no rotational stability. So this was uh, treated with an external fixator, type one. So you can see three cross pins in the distal fragment, two pins in the proximal fragment, and they are connected on the outside with a bar. This is done in a closed approach, so we do not open the fracture, we do not touch the fracture, we just align the proximal and the distal fragment. So we do not touch the fracture, because that is the advantage of external fixture. And that means also that we do not care so much about complete anatomic reduction of this site. So this is called a type one external fixture because we have a bar on one side on the unilateral side of the bone. So it's a closed approach, and you have to accept that there is not 100% reduction. That is not the aim of this technique. And then in the follow-up, you can see at six weeks, we have very fast formation 
of callus, a lot of callus formation. And that is because this is a young dog. This is healing very fast. And the, the aim of the external fixator is just to put the fragments aligned, the proximal and the distal fragment aligned in the AP view and in the medial lateral view. Because we know this bone will heal very quickly in a young dog. And a common problem with external fixator is that we have pin tract infection, like you see here. So very localized infection around the pin. And the pins will always come loose after six weeks, eight weeks. So in that time, the fracture should have healed. And then if we take off the external fixator and we follow the fracture, we can see that the callus is remodeling. So we see a nice remodeling on the bone. This with a huge callus that now becomes uh, normal again. So you can see how the callus, which is still irregular here, then remodels into normal bone in the long term follow-up. So let's go to the distal humerus. Distal humerus is a, uh, is a difficult part of, uh, of the bone and uh, are always considered uh, very difficult fractures because uh, the bone is uh, close to the elbow joint in this uh, level. Uh, we may have multiple fractures, they may extend into the joint. Um, they can be multi-fragment fractures that need to be addressed both on the medial and on the lateral side. We have the radial nerve in the vicinity of the distal humerus. So this is not the most easy uh, fracture treatment. This is an example of a uh, Staffordshire of a young dog, five months old, that was uh, uh, had some trauma to the elbow joint, and we can see here the elbow with an irregular features. We have a fracture here. It's not so clear where the fracture is exactly. Um, this is um, this is the medial side of the elbow. If you look here, the, this is the radius, and the radius always connects to the lateral compound. We have the growth plate that is still open here. This is the lateral view. This is the olecanon with its growth plate. Seems to be normal. We have the growth plate here of the proximal radius. And then we have a fracture that is very difficult to, to recognize here because of all the overlapping. Most likely, this was a medial compound fracture extending into the joint here. If we look at the joint surface, it's, uh, it's uh, broken here. Medial compound fracture into the joint. So if we look at this image, compound fractures here should be repaired with leg screw, leg screw fixation with a uh, pin against the rotation and then we can restore the shaft also with a pin. That's a very common uh, uh, procedure for condylar fractures of the humerus. And that's exactly what we did. So we have here the leg screw from the medial side going to the lateral side. We have a pin against rotation aligned with the screw and then we can restore the shaft here with a pin going up into the bone. You can see here that we have good reduction. We have restored the articular surface. Um, this was done by a medial approach. And the medial approach also allows you to look inside the joint and to look if you have good anatomic reduction 
of your uh, articular surface. So you can see here also a density. This is a washer. It is a, this device here, it's a washer. It's sort of a, a plug where you, uh, that prevents that the screw head will go into the bone. Because this is a young dog, so uh, if you turn this screw and turn it and turn it and turn it, you will go right into the bone. So it has to stop here, and this is done with this uh, washer. It's sort of a plug that prevents the screw head entering the bone. So this is a leg screw with a distal part that has threads, and the proximal part is, is uh, gliding. So this screw only has holding in the, this part of the bone, and that's why it compresses the fracture. It's called a leg screw. So other examples of uh, complex fractures of the distal part of the humerus that uh, need to be treated can be treated quite nicely with a plate on the medial side. So here we see the plate on the medial side. This is the lateral side, this tubercular. So this is the medial part of the humerus. And uh, also, of course, it's possible to do double plating if that is necessary. Put a plate on the medial side and put a plate on the lateral side. And we combine, we can combine that with an intramedullary pin. Um, I've shown you that example in that uh, Rhodesian Rift Bank. So here's another example: two-year-old Labrador hit by a car, which has a very typical fracture. This is called a Y fracture of the distal humerus. So it's an intraarticular fracture extending into the joint. This is the lateral compound which has broken, this is the medial compound. So when I look at this fracture, it's a very complex fracture. We need to repair this. Uh, we need to put something across the joint to compress the compounds together with a leg screw. And then we need to connect this part with the shaft again. And in the distal part, the medial side is a very nice part to put the plate on. So it's a distal humeral intercondylar wire fracture closed intraarticular. This needs internal fixation. This cannot be treated with splint. So step one, for the approach, we did an osteotomy of the olecranon to approach the elbow joint. Step two, we restore the condylar fracture by an intercondylar leg screw. And by that, we reduce the fracture from three fragments to two fragments. Step three, plate on the medial side of the distal humerus. And then we restore the oligonon with a tension band wire. That's how we approach this fracture. So if you have a fracture like that, it's always good to, before you are going to do surgery, try to make steps in your mind. What are, do you have a plan? You should have a plan if you go into this uh, fracture. You also should have a plan B. So you can have a plan A, but if it doesn't work, then you may have to convert it to something else. So this is uh, just showing the Y fracture in a bone specimen. So we connected the two condoms with a leg screw and then put a plate on the medial side. Here we can see in this dog, this is the leg screw, the washer, the plate on the medial side, and then the restoration of the uh, oleg condom. Here we see again that we have nice restoration of the articular surface of the distal tumors. And this is at six months post-op, shows nice healing of the fracture site. 
Okay, so now let's go to the radius. The radius and the ulna. Um, usually plates are the first choice for the radius, but it can also be um, fixed with external fixation. And then we can work on the lateral and on the medial side. So then we can apply a type two external fixator. So very important that we do not put pins in the radius. The radius is a very flat bone. Um, and if we put a pin in the radius, the pin may start to wobble from medial to lateral. So it's not common to put pins in the radius intramedullary pins. And the radius can be approached from the cranial side, especially in the proximal part. And then if we go distally, we also have a nice approach to the medial part of the radius. In the distal radius, we do a cranial medial approach to the bone. We can support fixation of the radius by putting a pin in the ulna. So very commonly, if the radius is fractured, we also have a fracture of the ulna, and then we can support the fixation by intramedullary pin in the ulna. In the proximal part of the radius, we can put a T-plate on the cranial side of the radius, if we have an articular fracture, we need a leg screw to repair the articular surface. If we have a growth plate fracture, like is shown here, this can be restored by cross pinning. So cross pinning is allowed, but not putting a pin in the medulla. And this is a very typical fracture for the proximal radius. It's called the Montechia fracture. And the Montechia fracture is defined as a fracture of the proximal ulna and luxation of the radius. And so with the fracture of the proximal ulna, there is also rupture of the interosseous ligaments and then the radius can luxate to the cranial side. It's a very typical fracture, it's called the Montecchia fracture. And if we repair this, we also have to repair the luxation of the radius. So we put a plate on the caudal side of the ulna, and the proximal screw, this screw, extends into the radius, this is a leg screw, to keep the radius reduced inside the joint. It's not common, this fracture, but you will see it once in a while. Um, it's a very typical fracture of the ulna with luxation of the radius. So this is uh, the possibilities to, uh, um, to treat shaft fractures of the radius and the ulna. So we can put a plate on the radius on the cranial side extending a little bit to the medial side. We can apply a type 1 external fixator. We can apply a type 2 external fixator. If we connect this with a bar on the other side, it's called a type 2. So this is uh, the combination of a plate and an intramedullary pin in the ulna. This is a very common treatment for radial fractures. So put a plate on the cranial side of the radius and co combine it with an intramedullary pin in the ulna. So here we have an example of uh, a dog hit by a car with a mid-shaft fracture of the radius and the ulna. We have dislocation to the lateral side. This is the lateral side, we look at the radius. And the ulna is here on the lateral side, so this is dislocation to the lateral side. We have not so much dislocation cranially, it is, it's overlapping, but it is aligned in this uh, view. 
It is a closed fracture most likely. It is extra articular and it is not stable. This is not a stable fracture. This is not a supported fracture. Radius and ulna are broken and it is more or less oblique. And oblique fractures are not stable fractures. So this is not a good candidate for splinting. This should be treated by surgery. Treatment options would be plates, external fixator. That would be my treatment options if I looked at this fracture uh, as a fresh case. Plate on the, on the cranial side, cranial, cranial medial side, external fixator type 1 or external fixator type 2. And we could combine this with the, the plate, we could combine with an intramedullary pin in the ulna. So this is what we did. We used a plate as the single treatment, put a plate on the cranial side, a long plate with minimum three screws on each side, but in this case we have five screws, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. So that is more than enough for immediate mobilization of this dog. So if we look at plating and stability after plating, then we have as a general rule that we say that we can trust the plate only when we have a minimum of three screws on each side of the fracture. A minimum of three screws that go, that take each cortex, so we count the cortices. So this screw takes one cortex, two cortex. This one also takes two, this one also two. So on this side we have five screws, ten cortices. On this side we have four screws, eight cortices. That is more than enough for immediate mobilization without any additional support. So we have to have a minimum of five to six cortices on each side of the fracture. Five to six cortices is three screws. If we use a locking plate, this is not a locking plate, but if we use a locking plate, then we can use less screws because a locking plate has, for each screw, has three fixation points. A fixation point in the plate, a cortex, and another cortex. So when we have a locking plate, a screw counts for three holding points. Okay, if we follow this over time, this is uh, the follow-up. Uh, we can see healing of the fracture side with callus formation. Not a lot of callus formation, but that is typical for bone plates. We have primary bone healing under the plate, and then it starts to remodel here. This was a, a multi-trauma patient. This was some days after the surgery. This dog also had a femoral fracture. So it had a radial fracture, but also a femur fracture. Actually, this was a, a dog, a guide dog for the blind. And uh, the owner, the client was on holiday and the dog had, was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, at a family. And then it, uh, it ran on the road and it was hit by a car. So we treated the femoral fracture with a plate and we treated the radial fracture also with a plate. It was an older dog, nine years old, um, but um, this is uh, some days after the fracture and we immediately start mobilizing the dog. So really try to walk the dog. This was in the winter, a little bit snow, and the dog is uh, fine and uh, doing great. This is another case where we, uh, if we classify this, 
It's a, mitch, it's a shaft fracture of radius and ulna with small fragments. It is not a stable fracture. There's hardly any dislocation, no dislocation in this direction, no dislocation in that direction, but it's instable. So this is not a good fracture for splitting. It's not supported, it's most likely a closed fracture. Joints are not involved. So that's the classification of this fracture. Treatment options would be plate on the cranial side, external fixture, type one, type two, if we put a plate on the radius, we can combine it with an intramedullary pin. This was treated with a plate on the cranial side. And here we can see the follow-up in the yearly. Eight weeks after surgery, we have already some callus formation or some um, bridging of the fracture gap. So bone healing with plates takes very slowly. You compare this with the humeral fracture that I showed you, six months old dog, with the humeral fracture that we treated with the external fixture. We have a very fast formation of callus, but with bone plates, the healing goes very slowly. So bone plates should be, we uh, should take at least six months to nine months for bone healing with plates, because we rely on primary bone healing which is a lot slower than secondary bone healing. You can see here that we have uh, these screws near the fracture site. They go away from the fracture site, not to enter the fracture site. Also, the plate has not been extended all the way to the joint because this will irritate the extensors if we put this really close we put the plate really close to the joint, then we get irritation of the extensor uh, muscles and tendons. This was also a, a young dog, two-year-old dog, and uh, already one day after the surgery, this dog was using the limb. Very active dog, uh, hard to restrain this dog. So you can see the difference between in age. So this dog really wants to go already, but it should really be kept uh, very quiet. This dog thinks now he can do everything with the limb, but it should be really restrained by the owner. Because plates, they are very nice, but they have their limitations in strength. So, fracture of the distal radius are very challenging fractures because they are very close to the joint, to the cardinal joint. And we can use T plates in distal radial fractures um, with locking screws to get good holding power. Uh, we can use double plating. Um, if we think we do not have enough support with plates only, then we should support it with a splint afterwards. And try not to put the plate too close to the carpus, because this will lead to lameness due to irritation of uh, extensor tendons, which are over your plate. So this is a case with a very distal fracture came here to the clinic with a splint, so that was that, that's nice with transportation. We put these uh, limbs with a splint and then they can be transported to another clinic. Then it arrives, so this was the fracture. This location to the cranial side, this is the distal part. So we define this location on the distal part, the cranial side. And not really this location in this view, maybe slightly to the medial part here. We have a fracture of the radius and a fracture of the ulna, very close to the joint. It's not a supported fracture, it's not a stable fracture. Um, so 
treatment options here would be plates, double plating, um, external fixator would be a possibility. But we have a very, very tiny little fragment here. We could still put two pins in here for an external fixture type two. Splinting would not be a good option for this uh, distal fracture. So this is what we did. We did a double plating technique. Put a plate on the T plate on the cranial side. This is the T plate on the cranial side. T plate two screws here next to each other, and we put another plate on the medial side of the radius. This is the medial side. This is the ulna here. So we did not touch the ulna. We only restored the radial bone with double plating. And this may be a problem in the future, that these plates are very close to the carpal joint. Um, this may lead to irritation on the dorsal surface here. And that, that, uh, that we need to take off the plates when the fracture has healed. So we'll keep a close eye on this here. If we see bone formation here, osteo osteophyte formation and irritation, then we have to take off the plates in the future. Okay, so we go to the carpus, fractures of the carpus. They uh, usually require internal fixation for anatomic reduction. Uh, they are sometimes missed carpal fractures because they are not so easy to see on radio crowns. If we have suspicion for a carpal fracture, then it's an indication maybe to do CT to get a full assessment of the carpus. If they are missed, then they will end up in chronic osteoarthritis, and then we can only do a pancarpal arthrodesis. So these are common carpal fractures, just fracture across the carpal bone, and these can be treated with a leg screw, shown here, but only, uh, only can do, we can only do that in the acute phase if this, is, uh, if this fracture is missed and we are presented with this case maybe two months later, then usually this is not a useful technique anymore and we do a pancarpal arthrodesis. Fractures of the accessory bone are quite common. They can be quite little fractures, slab fractures of the prominences. So there are many ligaments to the accessory bone. And uh, when this ligament pulls on the accessory bone, it may, uh, in trauma, it may take a little piece of bone. These are then avulsion fractures. So treatment is either resection of the piece of bone or treating if the piece of bone is large enough then we can treat it with a leg screw. They are always in stable fractures because there's always a pulling force on these pieces of bones. There's always a ligament attached somewhere that pulls away the piece of bone and then we can only treat it with a leg screw. And then we end with the fractures of metacarpal bones. Very common in cats, very common in dogs. Um, and these can be treated with uh, pins inside the bone. This is called the dowel pinning technique. Dowel pinning, putting pins inside the bone. Um, or in large, uh, in large dogs, we can also use plates on these bones. If we have metacarpal fractures, uh, if we only have one bone that is fractured, then it is a supported fracture by the other bones, then it can be treated by a splint. If we have uh, 
two bones that are fractured or three bones that are fractured, then we tend to use internal fixation. Either dowel opening in cats and small dogs or blades in larger dogs. Okay, so that is uh, the forelimb. Maybe any questions on fracture treatment of the forelimbs?